When the flames of fire destroy your dreams, the Lord will restore all that was lost. A member of the Tennessee Radio Hall of Fame, he has one of the most recognizable voices around the world. Keith Bilbrey was the announcer of the world famous Grand Old Opry for 35 years and is loved by many who have graced the stage. When his historic Nashville home in which he and his wife, Emmy Jo, lived burned to the ground, the common question among those who loved him was, how can we help Keith? God had a plan to restore what had been lost. Today, his voice can be heard on television shows like Huckabee and Larry's Country Diner. This is their story. This is Today's Nashville. This is Faith. Keith and Emmy Jo Bilbrey, I am so honored to sit down and spend this time with you. Normally, we're in your home but today we're in a barn next to your home. This is your home, and it's no longer there or part of it. We're gonna talk about that, but before, I wanna to talk to Keith and you, and Keith, you have been the voice of the Grand Old Opry for over 35 years. Well, I was, till a few years ago. <laughs> well, can you give me your voice there? Oh, uh. Like, introduce the sure, show. Sure. Presenting the Grand Ole Opry. Let her go, boys. I am so excited to sit down. What was it like to be the voice of the Grand Ole Opry? First time terrifying. <laughs> I, had, I had been a fan of the Opry since I was a kid. My dad listened to it every Saturday night. And I, I just dreamed, I don't know why, but I just dreamed of being there someday. When I was 12 years old, uh, some friends came in to town and we took them to the Grand Ole Opry. Are you first from time. Nashville? I'm from Cookville, which is okay, yeah. about 100 miles east. And uh, we all went to the Grand Ole Opry. I can tell you the exact place I sat at the Ryman Auditorium. Grant Turner, now Grant Turner was the voice of the Grand Ole Opry, undoubtedly. He, uh, he had been my hero. I had listened to him a million times. I knew exactly what he looked like although I'd never laid eyes on him. The show starts, I'm up in the balcony looking down, I'm finally gonna get to see Grant Turner. I didn't care who was singing, I wanted to see Grant Turner. And the curtain goes up and there's Grant Turner talking about Martha White Biscuits and it's like, who is that guy? <laughs> and I ran downstairs and I'm standing at the base of the podium looking up. It's not at all like I thought he would look like, you know? You have this, you know, radio's been called the theater of the mind and you have, exactly what these people look like in your mind. And he, he didn't look anything like that. But uh, long story short, uh, Grant and I became dear friends. He was one of my great mentors. He helped me in so many ways when I started announcing and just became a dear friend. And uh, he, he was the inspiration for me wanting to be a, a, a Grand Ole Opry announcer. Well, how did you get started? Well, I, I was... Uh, Actually, I, I had a job when I was 15 at the local radio station in Cookville, uh, WHUB. Listened to it all my life. I wanted to be there. And uh, I was at the interview. I had the job. The manager was talking to me. And he's looking there. He said, Keith, you're 15 years old. I said, yes, sir. He said, well, I'm sorry, but the child labor laws will not let me work you <laughs> the hours I need to work till you're 16. I was crushed. Absolutely crushed. He said, now you come back and see me when you turn 16. I left there. Uh, in fact, the secretary told me years later, as I, cause she said, I had never seen a kid so deflated in my life. You were just like, this is the end of the world. I'll, I'll never be in radio. I actually went 
on, up on the square in Cookville, my, uh, uh, Keith Crawford was an attorney there. He's the guy I was named for. I called him Uncle Keith. And I went into his office and I told the secretary, I need to see Uncle Keith now. And she got on the, on the intercom. She said, uh, Mr. Crawford, Keith Spilbury's out here. Needs, he really needs to see you. And I went in. I said, is there anything we can do, Uncle Keith? He said, no, it's a federal law. You, you can't do anything with it. So the minute I turned 16, I went back and I got the job. <laughs> so I started when I was 16 and was still in high school. I was a big deal in high school because I played rock and roll records on the radio at night. How did you get to the Grand Old Opry? Well, I'd been working on that since the beginning, put in several applications. Anything they had, I would have swept floors. I, didn't care. I wanted to get to WSM. And finally, I got a call from uh, Dave Overton, who was a well-known personality. He was the uh, manager of the FM station and wanted me to come to work for him. And I'm, I'm thrilled. He's, uh, I didn't even ask him how much I'm going to make. I don't care how much I'm going to make. And uh, he, that, that's one of the things. He said, well, Keith, uh, do you want to know how much you're going to make? I said, I don't really care, Mr. Overton. And he said, uh, well, uh, when can you start? Uh, tomorrow. He said, well, don't you think you ought to give the folks at WHUB a couple of weeks' notice? Well, yeah, I guess. <laughs> I mean, I was ready to get on a bus and go that day. Uh, but it all got worked out, and we started there. And uh, I took jobs on the AM station as I could, did the all-night show, this, that, and the other, and then the opportunity came to, to go to the Opry, and, and I did. Can you share a, just a few stories of, I don't know, some moments behind the Stage and well, the first time I was on the Opry, but people there are so welcoming. It, it, it truly was a family. And my first night, they pulled a little prank on me. To this day, I think Porter Wagner was behind this, but I'm not sure. But I was doing a Purina dog chow commercial before the curtain went up. And they all, all these stars gathered around me and barked like dogs. <laughs> And let me tell you something, Connie Smith does the best chihuahua you've ever heard. <laughs> I, I could have sworn there was a chihuahua in the background, but there was But anyway. But that's kind of how, how my career started. But I, I shared so many great moments and got to know these people I'd grown up listening to, like Hank Snow and Porter Wagner. My, my very favorite, the man who just, uh, I, I just cherished his, his memory is Ernest Tubb. Ernest was so kind to me. And I, even before I did the opera, I did the Midnight Jamboree. Uh, first night I was on there, uh, you know, Ernest, if you're familiar with that, it's his theme song was Walking the Floor Over You. He always ends the show with it. And he, he does a little Walking the Floor Over You. Then the band starts playing, and he, whoever the announcer is, says, get us out of here. Well, I just, I, okay, does he know my name? Does he know how to pronounce my name? Well, he gets to that part, and he said, get us out of here, Keith Bilbrey. And I just stand there and... <laughs> oh my God, he said my name. He did it just like he did with Grant Turner and Harold Ensley. And, and he looks at me like, is there a problem? <laughs> uh, oh, you've been listening to the Midnight Chamber. <laughs> but Ernest just taught me so much about public relations, how to, how to treat people. Uh, he was always very, he always had a top notch band, and he, he issued uh, markers for them to sign autographs with. You, Ernest was a big believer in treating the fans right. And he impressed upon us, if you insult a fan, you didn't insult them, Ernest Tubb did. And we will talk about that. We will. And, <laughs> and how did you and Emmy Joe meet? Well, we've known each other a long time. Yeah. You want to tell the story? Well, well we're going to come back with that because you two have an amazing story. And it has to do with this house, too. And we have more stories of the Grand Old Opry, and we're going to share about that in just a minute. Emmy Jo, how did you beat Keith? Well, we had known each other for a long time mm -hmm. through a mutual friend of ours that worked with Keith on Channel 4. So she would, he wanted to go out. He had been divorced 15 years. I'd been divorced 29 years <laughs> when we went out. And I really, neither one of us were really cared whether we, but I found out from Sharon that he had been trying to get her to get 
fixed up with me for a long time, and he hadn't finished sowing his wild oats. <laughs> so anyway, so she was protecting me. And uh, so the first night, uh, he called, and he said, hey, you want to go see this Mother's Brothers, and then we've got to go down to Gene Watson. We've got to do all this stuff. And I, I was so laid back. I was a single mom. I was raising my child, and, and I just thought, you know, I really don't date that much at that time. And I was just, so we went out. And it was like 110 miles an hour in my life. Before that was like 20 miles an hour. So that first night, we he got a speeding ticket. I mean, first you got a parking ticket mm -hmm. because he parked wrong at the T-Pack. Then we went through all this stuff I made with going, it too. yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then we get back and we stop back by Sharon Puckett's house, which is who our mutual friend was. She wanted to see us. We felt like we were on prom date, you know, come by and let me see y'all together. And when we got back, we had a beautiful porch swing kick thing. And I'm out swinging and it's late, you know. All of a sudden that boot stopped the swing just like that. And I thought, what's he going to do? He's going to kiss me and I don't know what to do. <laughs> I didn't know whether I wanted to kiss him or not. And nothing happened. And I said, well, what's wrong? And he said, I get motion sickness. <laughs> so no more swing for Keith. Well, let's talk about this house. Tell this, me what happened. Well, it was first of all, it was built in 1864, so it was on the historical register here. Then I had lived there 40 years, so when Keith came along, he's, we've been married 16 and a half years now, so he's been there and accumulated a lot of stuff in there too. And um, on June 22nd, we had uh, some steaks in the freezer from Mike Huckabee that uh, he had given us for Christmas. And I said, we need to be eating the rest of the remainder of these steaks. So Keith went outside to grill them on the grill. We don't cook. Let me make that straight right off the bat. But anyway, one of my biggest fears, because when I was in the third grade, we had a huge barn fire and I'm scared to death of fire. So the, always the first thing I say when we sit down to eat, did you turn the grill off? The second question is, did you turn the propane off? So we sat down and I said my usual thing, did you turn the uh, grill off? And he said, yes. And I turned the propane tank off, so I didn't even have to worry about it. And it just um, we finished eating, 20 minutes, and I was walking into the kitchen. We had an L-shaped porch around there, and the patios where the grill was right next to the kitchen. Well, I was recuperating from two major back surgeries, just barely out of the last one. So I had my van pulled right up next to the grill, and he went out to give the dog the scraps for, from the supper. And I came around and it was just so bright and all of the kitchen windows were just, I couldn't see the van or anything, but it never dawned on me it would have been fire. And I came around and I could hear him hollering and he was going, oh honey, call, we've got a huge problem. Call 911 and get out. Well, I still, I'm like trying to find a landline. I'm thinking landline. So I didn't have my walker with me, and I hobbled back into the den, grabbed the landline, called 911, came back across, and I have a picture of the, of the brick that surrounded our oven. And I got even with that and had 911 on the phone, and I could see, I just kind of glanced up and looked at the screen was melting, and it looked like little black bugs crawling down through there. And I got her on there and I said, oh my gosh, get us help. Our house is on fire. And I got even with that fire, with the brick. And the explosion happened. And it blew out all the windows behind me. I didn't even have any shoes on, just shorts, t-shirt. And I'm trying to skedaddle out of the house. But I remembered teaching in kindergarten, shut the doors. And I was going behind me, shutting the doors, pushing my wheels, trying to keep her on the line. And I said, I have to hang up. And I hung up. And she called back and she said, are you inside the house? And I said, yes. 
And she said, anybody else? And I said, no. And I was just trying. I said, I have to hang up. Call my son-in-law. He's a lieutenant with the police department. Tell him my house is on fire. I get out to the front porch, still not knowing where Keith is. He's outside somewhere. Little did I know, he had reached in the den and grabbed the keys to the van and started up the van. How God was there to keep that van from exploding because he got it out. And then I'm out on the front porch and realize I can't get down the steps. I am hurt. I'm on a wheel. I mean, on a walker. And the place we're sitting in right now belongs to Jim Sipes and Melody, his wife. And Jim had lived here 26 years and had never put in a mailbox. That day, he was putting in his mailbox oh. at the end of the drive. And there was a young couple, and we both have gated entrances. And the couple couldn't get in my gate, and they went down to his gate and said, hey, that house up there is on fire. And at, at that time, he turned around, and I was up just waving, help, help, I can't get down. So they all three came up, and it's caught on our ring that these three are running up the, the drive. And Jim goes, he hollers, and he says, is Keith okay? And I said, but I said, I don't know. He's around there. And I'm the couple runs up and helps me down, and I had put my foot on the second step. And we heard the second explosion. And so I told Jim, I said, I don't think he made it. I just don't think he made it. And so he, I'm trying to keep it together here. Um, he came around, and, he, and I felt like it was Easter because Jim was going, he's alive, he's alive. So I, I, oh. nothing else mattered. And the dog was an outside dog, and so he made it too. And so, and another weird thing is that we had a driveway just finished on Saturday. This happened on a Tuesday. Platforms were all still on it and everything. And uh, the remote control to the gate was hooked on my walker, and it had fallen off, I bet you, 500 times since Saturday. But I didn't feel good that day, and I just didn't get up to go put it back in the car. And I was able to stand there and push the button and let the fireman come in. And you know what? We're going to talk okay. about it when we come back. Okay. Emmy Jo, what happened when the fire trucks came? Well, they had to close the road. It was, it was such an explosion that you could see it from like three exits down on the interstate. And they did get my son-in-law that was the lieutenant. When he topped the hill, he could not believe. He, he didn't think we were alive. I mean, he really didn't know what to expect. And he got in. They had blocked the road. And because we live in the country, we didn't have any fire hydrants or anything like that. And they had to bring in water. And they made a makeshift uh, pool, I guess yeah, that's what you'd call it. Pools. And they would have to uh, bring the water up from there to put it out. And their concentration, that, and, you know, we were just, we were numb. We didn't even know. It destroyed People, your whole house, right? Oh, now. yeah. We had 94 volunteer emergency people there that night for us. Let's talk about some of the stories that came out of that. Some of the, you, I mean, you lost everything. Yeah. And you even had a grand old Opry room. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, we Tell did. me about that, and it well, was completely destroyed. It was memorabilia too. from 35 years at the Opry. A lot of the artists are gone now. I can never recover those things. What but, were some uh, of the things that were in your room? Oh, I had a bunch of stuff from, from George Jones, and I mentioned Hank Snow and Ernest Tubb. Just memorabilia. Uh, Little Jimmy Dickens boots. Yeah, uh, just various things. A lot of... Uh, Autographed. Yeah, uh, personal items that were autographed. And, uh, I, you know, the fire, the fire inspector told me, he said, you're going to be surprised at what survives and, and what uh, is destroyed. And I have been, constantly. Uh, John Hartford's letter. Mm -hmm. John and I were dear friends, and, of course, he wrote Gentle on My Mind, which was one of my absolutely favorite songs. I was on the way home from work one day. 
he called me. He says, Keith, I've got something for you. Can you run by the house? Well, yeah, I can run by the house. And I, I turned it around and went back. And John had written in his, uh, in his unique style of writing the first verse to Gentle on My Mind. It says, For my friend Keith, and it's signed, you, Your friend always on his stationery. We framed it, hung it on the wall. I thought, That's gone. Can't be. It was there. It's a little chart, as you can see, but, uh, but it was there. Uh, the things like that. <laughs> the one, one of the really strange things is we had a, a closet full of uh, just memorabilia, and there was a pack of matches from different uh, places, restaurants and stuff, and it was all just destroyed except for one pack of Shoney's matches, paper matches, how that survived, I will never know. But little things like that. Well, even this picture yeah. Yeah. survived. This, this yeah. was hanging in the hallway, mm -hmm. or in the office, actually. But, um, yeah, that's the way. It, and lots of, lots of weddings, and our wedding was here. We were, yeah. we were married in the backyard. And um, What about what these two items here? This, is, this was found... My father put the steeple on our church, and when he passed away in 2002, my girlfriends gave me a Christmas village house that I collected, and this says Joe's Church. And this was found probably five months later mm -hmm. in the ashes. And then this was too, and I had a best friend who actually was married to one of the Moody brothers, and she was... Um, in Paris, France, over there. They were entertaining over there. And I went over to visit with her, and we um, went to Notre Dame, and a cathedral, and she thought of me when she saw this Limoges box. So she passed away at age 33 to breast cancer, and I had gone down and kept her kids and things. And these are her ashes, and they were in the memory corner in the far back of the house. Five or six months later, out, out of the ashes, this little guy that was helping me came, and I just burst into tears because I, I knew they were there, but I didn't want to freak anybody out. And uh, I, I lost all of my mother and daddy's things and Keith's parents' things and all that over in that corner. But Susan survived right the fire, so I thought, I would come and share those with you. How does your faith keep you? Oh, oh there's just we call them God winks. There's yeah. all sorts of God winks going on here yeah. uh, throughout this experience. I, I never thought I'd see my Grand Ole Opry ring again. Was that yeah. lost in the fire? Yeah, oh, both that the wedding. and my wedding ring. And how the fireman found it, I will never know. God led him there is all I can say. It was Actually, under ashes. They were they were black. They were just covered in soot. And I took them to the jewelry store, and he made them look brand new. Actually, these were on our bedside table, which was an old blanket chest. And that whole room was burned, but that blanket chest and partial part of a dresser. And the fire inspector came. Nobody could go in. It burned for almost nine days, off and on. And so the fire inspector came out five days later, and he said, anything else? And Keith said, my wedding ring and my opera ring are right there in that room. And he goes, tell me where. The bed was nothing. You couldn't see. You saw the springs. That was it. And there on the corner were these sitting right where he told him they were mm -hmm. put. It's, it's just amazing what all. But, you know, our son-in-law, the same one that I called with his lieutenant, has just written a song, and it's Keeping the Faith. And no that's what, what we've happens, done. Keep the faith. Keep, the, keep faith. the faith, and that that's you know you could cry buckets of tears, and we have done that. There's no doubt about it. But we're so blessed to be here so in she this got room. Out, my dog got out. I got out. One I of know. the things that uh, I cherish my guitar collection, mm -hmm. and uh, the night of the fire, I, I told the, the the firemen where they were. And all of a sudden, two firemen came out with their hands just full of guitars. My father's guitar, my deceased son's guitar. Buck Owens gave me a, a guitar. It's got to my so friend. So they were saved. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Buck you Owens. Just bro they broke the front window and just walked straight through it. They saved it. all my guitars but one. 
I, I, was, I just couldn't believe it. I, I, when, he, when they came, I said, can I hug you? And he said, trust me, you don't want to hug me. He had his fire equipment on. And I said, well, just consider yourself hugged. <laughs> but things like that. My grandpa's banjo was in that collection. Are you rebuilding? Yes, the exact same plan. We, we are getting our builder in place. By the time this runs, hopefully, we will have finalized getting a builder and starting on it. It's taken a long time to get things together. Well, God's I've, grace has been throughout our, the whole And our family thing. Bibles, well, I really hate that we lost. But we have you lots, have, but we have two your, pages that were from your blown. We found them way back by the fence row in the ashes. And so, Well, Keith and Emmy Joe, what a blessing it is to sit down with you. And thank you so much for sharing your lives uh, your journey, your faith, and um, we'll be praying that the, the house gets rebuilt very soon. Quickly. <laughs> yes, please. Please, quickly. <laughs> please. My friend, has your life been shattered and you've lost everything? Like Keith said, keep the faith, cling on to the Lord. He has it under control. This is today's Nashville. This is faith. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.